everybody. This is Phil Bell, your favorite highly trained rail enthusiast. I want to start by thanking each and every one of you for watching episode 41 about the Southern Pacific Santa Fe. I had a great time putting the episode together. Thanks to all of you for watching it. It's one of my favorites. But as I was listening to it, there were a couple of things I wanted to clarify for you. First of all, we talked a lot about the exemption process. And the exemption process is one way that someone can purchase and take control of a railroad. Now, to be clear, the exemption can be used for a variety of transactions. One transaction might be if I, as an individual, or if I owned my own company, wanted to go out and buy a railroad. You file an exemption with the Service Transportation Board, and that tells them that it is not a significant transaction. They will review it, agree, and then allow the transaction to proceed. Now, there are other situations where one railroad may purchase another and can use the same exemption process. One example would be if, uh, let's say that the Iowa Northern were to purchase a nearby short line. Now, of course, we know Iowa Northern will soon be acquired or is likely to be acquired by Canadian National, but just for an example purpose, if the Iowa Northern acquired a five-mile short line nearby, this is something that would not be considered to be substantial, and therefore they could file that exemption and have the transaction completed quickly. Now, of course, it is up to the Surface Transportation Board and its staff to determine if, in fact, it is an insignificant transaction. So so one thing that could make it significant would be if there was a major ethanol shipper on the Iowa Northern and the same shipper is now on the short line to be acquired and it generated, let's say, 200,000 carloads per year for both of them, someone could decide, wait a minute, this is significant, especially if the shipper were to object to that and then give the transaction a more extensive review. There are a variety of things that can go into it and I just want you to understand that while the exemption can be filed, they are under no obligation to simply allow you to have the relaxed uh, review of the transaction process. Another is if you are a railroad and you own multiple railroads, company, excuse me, that owns multiple railroads, and one example of that is Genesee and Wyoming, another would be Rail America, and if they wanted to acquire another railroad, they are often able to utilize the exemption process again, as long as the transaction does not rise to be significant in the eyes of the Service Transportation Board. So that is something I really wanted you to understand. And then there is one more thing. It is very interesting to me when I look back in the 1980s, especially in the era of the so-called corporate raider. So we talked a little bit about Michael Dingman and a lot of the activities that went along with that. I wanted to clarify a little bit the idea of the poison pill. So when we hear about the term corporate raider, especially as it applies to larger companies, particularly in the late 1980s and into the early 1990s, these were people who utilized generally high yield bonds, so-called junk bonds, to finance a lot of the transactions. And a lot of the companies would come out of these skirmishes as being highly leveraged. So one of the ways that entrenched managements tended to fight them off is simply by calling them corporate raiders, uh, using terms like green mail and so on to try to make them look negative in the business press. So that is one of the epithets that was used against Michael Dingman, not only when he was coming after the Santa Fe, but other companies that he in got involved in or attempted to. Michael Milken is another big name that you hear in this because his company, Drexel Burnham Lambert, tended to fund a lot of these individuals by providing them the capital by underwriting the sale of high yield bonds or so-called junk bonds. And to be clear, there's absolutely nothing junk about the bonds. The bonds are actually called that because they are considered that from a rating standpoint. And a lot of institutional investment managers are not allowed to invest in them. Now, when Dingman came after the Santa Fe, he did it for a variety of reasons. First of all, the Santa Fe, now after it had sold off Southern Pacific, had cash, number one. And number two, it had a lot of property assets far going beyond the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe itself that it owned. And many of these were properties that it acquired from the Southern Pacific. And therefore, if you are a purchaser or a prospective purchaser of a company and you see a lot of property, especially property that is unencumbered, that means that you have the opportunity to use that property to borrow money, selling high yield bonds and otherwise, in order to get these transactions done. So therefore, that is what made the Santa Fe a target of uh, not only Michael Dingman, but also Olympia New York, which was mostly a property company located, uh, headquartered in Toronto, Canada, but had been known to get involved in other investment ideas over the years. Now, of course, these did not succeed, and this is what led to the creation of 
or excuse me, execution of the poison pill that Rob Krebs, when leading the Santa Fe, did in order to fend off some of the prospective acquirers. Now, poison pills are loved by some and hated by others because they are certainly something that is somewhere in the middle. Now, in the case of the Santa Fe, uh, for those of us who are rail enthusiasts and a lot of people who worked on the railroad, they tended to like the poison pill because that meant the Santa Fe didn't end up being taken over by Michael Dingman or Olympia New York. Now, we don't have any evidence to suggest that either of them would have done a bad job operating the company or even kicked out um, Rob Krebs, who had actually not been there all that long and was not necessarily considered to be entrenched management. Although, in situations like this, management is often under fire because that means there is some sort of a value gap perceived by the market. And the value gap is usually when the stock of the company is worth less than the assets, the book value assets of the company. Uh, one of the examples of this, if we go back a few years, Norfolk Southern, uh, currently with Encore, although it is not experiencing a value gap, but years ago, CSX with the Children's Investment Fund. These are situations where you had some of these activists, as they would be considered today, getting involved because either they perceived a value gap or because the positive value gap, where the value of the company itself is above the value of the assets, is not high enough. So that's why some of these activities would would be undertaken. Now, with respect to the poison pills, just for a little bit of a clearer explanation, management may, depending on the company's bylaws, have a wide variety of things that it can do in order to insulate itself and to prevent the company from being taken over. It all depends on what has been written into the company's bylaws, and oftentimes you may read about a company choosing to adopt a so-called poison pill defense in the event that it is uh, potentially under fire. Now, a good example is Conrail. Conrail did not have a poison pill defense in its bylaws. However, there was a law in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania where Conrail was incorporated that basically said anybody who was going to acquire a certain amount of the company had to receive approval in order to go forward. And that generally meant that you as management would have to uh, work with that acquirer and recommend these things to the shareholders. And so this is what enabled CSX to get a hold on Conrail, although Conrail wanted it because that was the merger that they had proposed and made it harder for Norfolk Southern to simply swoop in with a bigger pitch to investors. And that's what led to the bidding war, which ultimately culminated in Conrail's division between CSX and Norfolk Southern with shareholders receiving $115 in cash, which for Conrail stock was an astronomically high amount. So I wanted to make sure that you understood a fair amount of these interesting facets of what goes into transactions such as Southern Pacific Santa Fe, the exemption process, as well as poison pills, because all of them mattered to both the potential SPSF merger as well as the Santa Fe itself in the time after the merger was disallowed by the Interstate Commerce Commission. So we're going to be back is next week and we'll be talking about passenger trains all week because on the 3rd of May, it is Amtrak's anniversary. So we always like to celebrate in some way, whether it is saying a lot of really cool things about Amtrak or a few bad things or a little bit of both. So make sure you tune in Monday, Wednesday, and next week. We'll also be doing Thursday where we do a book review related to Amtrak as well. So we will see you down the main line and I hope you have a great day.